Hi, I'm Dr. Manil Sivasinghe, and I'm a clinical lecturer and consultant radiologist at the King's College London and Guy's and St. Thomas's Pet Centre. And I'm here today to talk to you about scans in lymphoma. I will talk about why we need to scan in lymphoma, who is involved in scanning, and then talk about the various scans that we have at our disposal, including X-ray, ultrasound, CT, MRI, and PET CT, which I will focus on at the end as that's my area of specialist interest. So why do we need to scan in lymphoma? Well, we can scan persons with lymphoma at any time point during their journey. But if we take it right back to when a person may present to their doctor with enlarged lymph glands in their neck, their armpit, or their groin, which is suspicious of lymphoma, if we do a scan at that stage, the main reason for doing the scan is to support that clinical diagnosis of lymphoma. But importantly, at that stage, when we look at scans, it's important to think about alternative causes for why a person may have enlarged lymph glands or nodes. And common things that we think about and we may be able to identify in the scan would be infection, something called tuberculosis, for example, or an inflammatory condition such as sarcoidosis, which, although non-cancerous, can still cause significant ill health. But let's say we've confirmed a diagnosis of lymphoma. Well, the main reason for doing a scan at that stage is to stage the lymphoma. So staging is a process where we categorize how far the lymphoma has spread throughout the body. And we use a system where we split the body in half um, using the muscle called the diaphragm, which separates the chest from the tummy. And we look at where the lymph nodes or other sites of disease are. So in this diagram here, you can see that this person has enlarged lymph nodes in their neck in one site on one side of the diaphragm. And we would call that stage one. When we have more than one site of nodal enlargement, but on the same side of the diaphragm, we call that stage two. As soon as we have nodal enlargement on either side of the diaphragm, that's called stage three. And then when we have sites of disease where we don't tend to find white blood cells, which is where lymphoma comes from, such as sites like the lung or the liver or the bone marrow, we would call that stage four. Importantly, the reason for staging is so that we can help plan treatment because for different stages of disease, we have different treatment strategies. So for example, for Hodgkin's lymphoma, if you had stage one disease, the normal treatment would be two cycles of chemotherapy followed by radiotherapy. Whilst if you had stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma, the treatment would be six cycles of chemotherapy. So you can see how staging really does help plan treatment. And in addition, it helps us give an idea regarding outlook. It helps us doctors to give those with lymphoma an idea about prognosis. So here's an example of a CT scan used for the purposes of staging. So as you can see here, we've outlined the diaphragm and you can see that we have the kidneys just here and also here on this image. There are enlarged lymph nodes at the level of the kidneys, which are beneath the diaphragm, and there are enlarged nodes above the diaphragm within the chest. So we are already dealing with stage three lymphoma. You can also see that the spleen is abnormal, it's enlarged in size, and there are dark areas of gray, which are also not normal and in keeping with lymphoma. If we look at the lungs, which generally should be black, we can see that there are these white nodules, which are again, abnormal, and these are also sites of lymphoma. So this is a person with stage four lymphoma. We can also use PET-CT, uh, which I will talk about later, to stage patients with lymphoma. These scans essentially demonstrate the distribution of radioactive sugar throughout the human body, and a general rule of thumb is that anything that is black often reflects cancer. An exception to this is the brain and the heart, as you can see here, which actually use a lot of sugar to generate their energy. But as well as that, the kidneys and the bladder, which is how the body gets rid of the radioactive sugar. 
Now, what's common to all of these persons is that they all have stage four lymphoma. There is lymphoma involvement of their bone marrow. But each one of these persons has a different type of lymphoma. The first person has Hodgkin's lymphoma. The second, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The third, follicular lymphoma. The next, mantle cell lymphoma. And the final patient, CLL. So the take home message here is that although our scans can tell us how far a lymphoma has spread, what it can't do is tell us what type of lymphoma a patient has. So this leads on nicely to the next major role of scans, and that is to provide imaging guidance to help us take samples from abnormal tissue. And this is known as a biopsy. Now these samples of tissue are sent to the labs so that the cells can be looked under a microscope by doctors called histopathologists. And their primary role is to tell the difference between normal cells and abnormal cells and be able to tell us whether we are actually dealing with a lymphoma. And if it is a lymphoma, for them to be able to tell us what type of lymphoma are we dealing with. Because it's important to know that different types of lymphoma have different types of treatment. So it's really important to know what type of lymphoma we're dealing with. Now we can use ultrasound to help us guide taking a sample of tissue. So this is an example of an ultrasound of a person's neck. And you can see that there's about a three centimeter node in their right neck. We can assess how much blood is going to this lymph node. And this will help us tell whether we might envisage seeing some complications such as bleeding when we put a needle into it. But also it helps us tell us whether there are any important structures nearby like major blood vessels that we should try and avoid when we're trying to take this sample of tissue. And importantly with ultrasound, we can also visualize the needle really well, as you can see there, which makes sure that we're getting a really good sample that will give us the right answer when we send it to the labs. Now ultrasounds are ideally suited for taking samples from superficial structures, things that are close to the skin surface. So the neck, the armpits, the groins. But in some instances, lymphoma doesn't necessarily always involve those sites. So we might need to use another type of imaging test. So this is a CT scan. And as you can see here, there is a needle being slowly progressed to take a sample of tissue from a lymph node that is lying deep within the abdomen, the tummy. Now you can see that with the scan, we can really make sure that we are getting a perfect sample of tissue to get the right answer. But you can also see that we have to avoid some important structures on the way. So you can see that the kidney is really close to that needle, as is a couple of major blood vessels that lie within the abdomen. One of them, the major artery called the aorta, and the other, the inferior vena cava, which is the major vein. So again, using imaging guidance really helps us make sure we are getting the best sample for a diagnosis of lymphoma, whilst ensuring that any potential complications related to biopsy taking are minimized. So once people have started treatment for lymphoma, we can use scans to help identify how well or not so well these treatments are working. We compare appearances on a scan during or after treatment with the appearances before the treatment was started and essentially spot the difference. So here's an example of a CT scan done before treatment where you can see that there is these abnormal areas of uh, dark gray within the liver and the spleen. So that's lymphoma involvement. At the end of treatment, we can see that there are still these areas of abnormality in the liver and the spleen, but they're smaller than before. So we would class this as something called a partial response. So it's not completely gone, but it's slightly gone. We can use PET-CT to assess response. And in this person, you can see that they've got lymphoma throughout the body and it's involving sites that are not typically associated with uh, white blood cells, so the lungs and the bone marrow. So this is stage four disease. And you can see during chemotherapy, so this person hasn't actually finished their treatment, that all those sites of lymphoma have melted away. And this is what we call a complete metabolic response. So really good news. Now there is a final type of response that I've not shown here, which is when the treatment hasn't worked and the lymphoma hasn't responded to the treatment and may have actually grown during treatment. This is something we call disease progression, which can be a bit confusing because it's a slightly poor term um, because in normal language, when we use the word progress, 
uh, outside of medicine, you might use that in a positive context. So the final type of response is disease progression, which means that the disease has not responded to treatment. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there are no other options. And we often have many lines of treatment still to be used in lymphoma. Once people have finished their treatment of lymphoma, we can then use scans to determine whether the lymphoma has come back or not. Now, the return of someone's lymphoma is usually discovered by themselves uh, because they might notice new lumps or bumps in their necks, their armpits or their groins, or they might notice that things have changed. They might be feeling more tired, that they've lost weight or they've got new fevers. And it's in these instances that you would do a scan to try and investigate these symptoms. And ideally, you would either confirm that yes, sadly, the lymphoma has returned, or if there's nothing to see on the scan, well then this scan can be of great reassurance for all those concerned. So that's scans in a nutshell. And my final slide really is to show that all the decisions we make with regards to lymphoma care are not made on an individual basis, one person making that decision, but are discussed in something called a multidisciplinary team meeting, which involves a whole host of individuals, including radiologists, hematologists, uh, clinical oncologists, those are the uh, doctors who deliver the radiotherapy, nurse practitioners, uh, junior doctors in training, and all of these individuals are acting together to make the best treatment decisions for each person discussed. And this is happening throughout the UK um, for every new cancer diagnosis on a weekly basis, more often than not. So that's scans in a nutshell. So let's now talk about who is involved with scanning. Now this section is a bit of self-promotion, yes, but I also be, believe it's important to be aware of the healthcare professionals who are vital to the care of persons with lymphoma, but who you may not necessarily meet in person during your journey. So let's talk about a radiologist, that's who I am. So who is a radiologist? Well, I got this mug from my, my wife uh, for Christmas one year, and the definition of a radiologist on this mug is someone who solves a problem you don't know you had in a way you don't understand. See also wizard or magician, so a really good way to promote my, uh, my ego. But in all seriousness, um, a radiologist is a specialist doctor, and we are trained to interpret medical images in order to diagnose, treat, and monitor a variety of conditions, not just cancer, but infections, uh, trauma, where people have been in accidents, so a whole host of disease processes. And we are trained in a number of imaging techniques and scanning technology, which I will talk about later on in this talk. Uh, but importantly, there are radiologists who also run clinics. You might meet them in person. Um, if those of you have had biopsies, which will be predominantly all of you, uh, the person doing the biopsy is often a radiologist. And then there's a special brand of radiologists who actually undertake minimally invasive surgery. And these are procedures done usually through veins or arteries or going through organs. And these type of radiologists are called interventional radiologists. So we are a really important specialty in the field of medicine. Now, it's a long, hard road to get to a consultant radiologist. I just thought I'd show you what I've been through. So medical school for me took six years, then nine years of junior doctor training. Um, I then finished my training and then did another year specializing in PET-CT. And it's in 2014 that I've became a consultant radiologist and I've so nearly coming up to 10 years now. So all in all, 16 years of training before I became a consultant. So to become an expert in imaging, it takes a really long time, as it does for many other fields in medicine. Uh, but hopefully that gives you reassurance that you are being dealt with by experts in the field. Now, it's not right of me just to talk about myself, because importantly, we radiologists do not work alone. We work with other expert healthcare professionals who are vital members of the imaging team. But Sometimes our job titles can get confusing and we can be confused with one another. So I thought I'd just try and clear that up on this slide. So I think the first type of person to mention is the radiographer. Now they're not doctors, but that doesn't mean they're not experts. And they are experts in, in getting the best images from the machines that they use. And these are the people you'd meet when you're coming for a scan. Now a radiographer who can specialize in performing ultrasounds, they're called a sonographer. 
And then finally, a radiographer who is trained in actually operating the radiotherapy machines, which are used to kill the cancer, well, they're called therapeutic radiographers or radiotherapists. So vital members of the imaging team that um, are key members uh, as part of your lymphoma care. Right, so let's move on to types of scan. Now, I thought before I talk about the scans themselves, I thought it's important to talk about the concept of radiation because it's something that people are sometimes worried about uh, when it comes to certain types of scan that use radiation. So what is radiation? Well, it's the emission, that means it's coming out of, or transmission, which means going through, of energy, which can be in the form of waves and particles going through space or through a material medium like the human body. And this is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And as you can see here, we are surrounded by radiation, power lines, uh, mobile phones, microwaves, visible light. So that's all a form of radiation. The key bit is it is non-ionizing radiation, which means that it doesn't do damage to our bodies. The higher energy radiation, such as ultraviolet light that comes from the sun, which can damage our skin, as well as X-rays and gamma rays, which is what we use for medical imaging. Now those in high enough quantities have the potential to cause damage to our cells to result in a cancer developing. So that's why we worry about radiation. But it's important to remember that the guiding principle of medical imaging is to keep radiation doses with our imaging techniques as low as reasonably possible, but sufficiently high enough that we can get actually an answer to provide the important diagnosis that is required. The fact that you may not be aware of is that for every year that we live on this planet in the UK, we all receive a radiation dose of about 2.7 millisieverts. That's the unit of radiation dose that we measure. And that equates to about 100 chest X-rays for every year that we live in the UK. Now, if you live in Cornwall, that's about two and a half times higher, and that's because of the presence of radon in igneous rock down in the southwest of the country. You can also get radiation by doing a transatlantic flight from London to New York because you're closer to the sun, so you receive more cosmic rays. But even on a plane flight, that's about four chest X-rays. I think this is the most important fact, putting radiation into context. The risk of one of us developing cancer now is one in two, 50%. So what is the additional risk that medical imaging provides? Well, if you look at this diagram and focus on the middle, so CTs, interventional radion, PET CT, on average, one scan will give us about 0.1% additional risk of cancer. So going from 50%, to 50.1%. So I think if you think about radiation in that context, the information gained from scanning likely outweighs that relatively small increase in risk of cancer. And remember that this is still a theoretical risk because there's still to be a proven documented case of cancer that has resulted from imaging. So with radiation dealt with, let's talk about the imaging techniques we have available. So X-rays. So these use a very small amount of radiation that pass through the human body to create an image. And this is a chest radiograph. And what we're looking at is the differential stopping of these X-rays based on the density or the thickness of the tissues that these X-rays are passing through. So if an X-ray passes through the body very easily, like the lungs, which are full of air, it appears black. But if it gets stopped by structures in the human body, such as the spine, which is our bones, well, they appear white. X-rays are really quick and easy to perform, only take a few seconds, and they can give us some really quick information and some simple answers to quick problems. So if someone's got breathlessness or cough, maybe whilst on chemotherapy, a chest X-ray would be really good at looking for whether there's a chest infection. We can also quickly look at the chest to see if there are any enlarged nodes. And in this person, you can see that they've got enlarged nodes within their chest, which was secondary to lymphoma. And we can also use chest X-rays to help us identify lines and tubes that we may need to put into you whilst you're receiving chemotherapy to provide you with treatment and to stabilize your condition. So in this person, they can see that they've got a breathing tube, which is in a good position. They've got a central line, 
which is used to give medication into one of the bigger veins within the chest. And there's also a feeding tube, which is going down into the stomach. So chest X is really useful, very quick, and very small amounts of radiation. If we then talk about ultrasound, we're not using radiation to create an image with ultrasound. What we're using is high frequency sound waves to create the images of the body. And a lot of you may have had this, where you have to put, it's supposed to be warm, but often it's cold jelly onto the skin surface. And the reason for the gel is to enable the sound waves to go from the transducer into the human body for it to be bounced back, so echoes essentially, back to the transducer and for that to then create an image. The key bit about ultrasound is that there is no radiation involved, so it's entirely safe. And that's why we use it when we are scanning uh, women who are pregnant and why we prefer to use ultrasound for children because children's cells are developing and re reproducing very quickly because they're growing and so they're more sensitive to radiation so we will always try and use imaging techniques that don't tend to use radiation first and foremost in children now ultrasound is really good at uh, ideally assessing nodes that are close to the skin surface easy to reach areas so the neck the armpits the groins and you can see here that we can tell what a normal lymph node looks like which is this kidney bean ovoid shape we can see that it's normal because there's a vessel just coming in through the middle of that lymph node. And as I've already shown you, we can then also see needles being put into abnormal lymph nodes to help us target taking biopsies. So ultrasound is a really versatile imaging technique. And again, very quick, very easy to perform and uses no radiation. Moving on to the, what we call cross-sectional imaging modalities, let's talk about CT. So CT stands for computed tomography. And what this involves is sending a set of x-rays through the human body, not through one direction, but through multiple directions. And by doing this, we can then create an image that you've already seen before. But we don't necessarily have to look at the image in one plane. We can then look at the image as if the person's looking at us. So we can create multiple different directions to look at the different structures in the human body. And these are really detailed images, as you can see. Now, this is what a CT scanner looks like. It looks like a donut or a polo mint. And scanning takes a few minutes on average. The key principle for most of these techniques is to keep still. Um, and you might have to follow some breathing instructions. But like if we're taking a photo on our camera, if you move, then the image becomes blurred. Similarly, if you move whilst you're having a scan of your body, well, the image becomes blurred. And it can be very difficult for us to give you the right answers. So it's really important to stay still. When you have a CT scan, it often involves using something called contrast, which will inject through a vein, either through a needle or a plastic tube called a cannula. But that can be problematic, especially if you've had reactions to that contrast in the past, such as an allergy, or if you've got poorly functioning kidneys. But those are the things that we will ask you about before you have the scan. If you're talking about radiation dose, which is what CT scans involve, if you look at the chest, the abdomen, the tummy, and the pelvis, an average CT scan of that area will amount to about three and a half years of annual radiation. But importantly, the additional risk that you get from that, less than 0.1% on top of that 50% risk of cancer that all of us have. And it's a versatile imaging modality that can be used for diagnosis. It can be used to help guide biopsies, as I've already shown you. It can help plan treatment. So when we're planning radiotherapy, we use a CT scan, and then we can use it to assess response to treatment. So a CT scan really is the workhorse in lymphoma care. Moving on to another cross-sectional imaging modality, this is MRI. So MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging. So again, here we don't use electromagnetic radiation. What we use is a magnetic field, and we use radio waves. And what we do is we excite hydrogen atoms in our human body. Now, hydrogen is linked to oxygen to make water in our human body, and our body is made predominantly of water. So that's why magnetic fields work in our body. And what we do is we excite these hydrogen atoms, and then they release energy, and we can then create, again, very detailed 3D imaging of the human body, comparable with the CT scan. 
Now, scanning on an MRI scanner takes longer than a CT scan, on average 20 to 30 minutes, but it can be longer than that depending on how much uh, of the body you are imaging in one go. But again, the same principle of keeping as still as possible is really important for an MRI scan. And you may also have to follow breathing instructions. The real benefit of MRI imaging is that there is no radiation involved. And again, this is why we find it easy to use and safe to use in women who are pregnant and in children. However, there are some problems that you may face with an MRI scanner. Now, an MRI scanner is a bit more of a tunnel than a donut or a polament like a CT scan is. So claustrophobia is a problem that we do often encounter because lying in a very enclosed space for nearly half an hour can be scary. Um, but again, if that's a problem, we can try and sort that out. We've got other imaging techniques that we can use to assess uh, certain conditions. People with pacemakers can also find MRI problematic because the magnets can actually deactivate the pacemakers, which is not good if that pacemaker is used to keep your heart going, for example. So again, these are questions that we will ask before we, you turn up for your scan. And then again, metallic foreign bodies that may have come from old injuries can be an issue, particularly if they are in areas where the metal could move, because once you go into the, metal, uh, the magnet, uh, we don't want these things moving whilst in the magnet. So again, these are questions that we will ask. These are all part of the safety questionnaires that are done before every single scan done with MRI. And finally, chronic kidney disease can also affect whether we do or do not use something called contrast, a different type of contrast with our MRI scans. But importantly, MRI has its own place in assessing lymphoma when lymphoma involves the brain and the spine, and that includes the spinal cord. And here's an example. This is a PET CT scan where actually these red and green and orange areas is normal uptake of radioactive sugar within the brain. But there is lymphoma in the brain on this scan. It's very difficult to see. But what you can see is the arrow is actually where the lymphoma is. You can see how difficult it is to see on our PET CT scan. But if you look at the MRI scan, you can really see how conspicuous that lymphoma deposit is and how better seen it is compared to the PET CT scan. If we compare MRI to CT of the spine, if you're looking at that spine, take it from me, that's a normal spine apart from this fracture of this virtual body here. But if we look at the MRI done in the same patient, all these white areas are areas of lymphoma, which you just can't see on a CT scan. And similarly, you can't even see the, de the deposit of lymphoma that's surrounding the lower spinal cord. So that's why MRI really is important with certain structures of the human body. Right, so let's talk about the very last imaging modality and my favorite area. This is called PEPCT. So PEP stands for positron emission tomography and CT is attached to that. So we're doing a PET-CT scan, which is a combined imaging modality. Now, positron emission tomography is a type of radioactive decay. And what we're actually imaging are these gamma rays, which are firing off at about 180 degrees to one another, so in opposite directions. By knowing that these gamma rays fly off in opposite directions, we then surround the person in a scanner by a ring of detectors and we detect these gamma rays. These gamma rays are emitted by the radioactive uh, isotope or pharmaceutical that we inject into a person's vein. And for the purposes of cancer imaging, we inject radioactive sugar. And this is taken up by a, a wide variety of cells, but is mainly taken up by cancer cells. But importantly, we must also remember that it's taken up by other types of cells, such as immune cells involved in infection and inflammation. And as I've already shown you, it's taken up by normal cells, such as the brain, uh, the heart, and also the kidneys and the bladder. And as I've already mentioned, what PET-CT provides us is it provides us information about how much glucose or how much sugar the cells in the human body are using, but it also provides us uh, structure, uh, which is provided by the CT scan. So the PET-CT, is a one-stop shop giving us two bits of information for the price of one. Now, those of you who've had a PET CT scan will know that it's a slightly more involved process than a CT or an MRI scan. So the first thing you have to do is you have to 
fast, so not eat anything for six hours. And that's because we want uh, all the radioactive sugar that we inject into the vein to go to where we want it to go to, to the cancer cells. But you are allowed to drink water, you're allowed to take your normal medication, but what we would advise you is not to do any strenuous activity. Now, if someone were to eat before their PET CT scan, this is what it would look like. A lot of the radioactive sugar has gone to the muscles in the human body, but not to the lymph nodes that are enlarged in this patient. And so this is what we would call a non-diagnostic scan, and we'd probably have to repeat the scan again, unfortunately. Before you come for your scan, we will check your blood sugar, and that's because we don't want the blood sugar levels to be too high, because that can also interfere with our scan and make our scan less accurate. Once we're happy that the blood sugar is low enough, uh, we will then insert a needle or a cannula, or if you've got a tunneled line for chemotherapy, we might use that to inject the radioactive sugar, called FDG, into the bloodstream. We'll then ask you to wait for about 60 minutes and ask you to rest comfortably on a chair. And that's to allow the radioactive sugar to spread through the body and be taken up by the cells. Now, as I've shown you, the kidneys get rid of the radioactive sugar and it accumulates in the bladder. And so just before you start the scan, we'll ask you to go and empty your bladder so we can get rid of the um, radioactivity in your pelvis. You will then hop onto the couch and we will firstly do the CT scan. That takes about less than five seconds. And in this case, you don't have to hold your breath. You will then have to lie there and we will then slowly acquire the PET CT scan in about 15 to 20 meter positions. And we'll spend about three minutes over each bed position. So depending on how tall you are and how much we're covering, that scan will take about 20 minutes or so. And what we'll then do is we'll then fuse those images to allow us to interpret the scan and give the answers that you need. And if we're talking about radiation dose, so PET CT scans have more radiation dose than CT scans in general. So about five years worth of background radiation. So five years of living on this planet. But again, that risk, that additional risk is still less than 0.1% on top of the 50% that we are all due with cancer. So here are some examples of how we can use PET CT to help us with the care of people with lymphoma. So this person has follicular lymphoma and we're doing this scan before they've started treatment. They had an MRI scan first of all, which found that there was a lump in their neck, which they had noticed. A CT scan that was done didn't show any other sites of lymphoma. So this is one side of the diaphragm. So this is stage one disease. So for follicular lymphoma, we could try and cure this person by giving them radiotherapy. But we did a PET CT scan to make sure that it truly was stage one disease. So on the PET CT scan, you can see that it's red, which means that it's using a lot of sugar. So this is typical of a site of lymphoma. But you can see that on the scan, there are lots of other sites of abnormality that are likely related to lymphoma, particularly within the bone marrow, as you can see here. And there's nothing at all to see on the CT scan. So this is involvement of the bone marrow, which is stage four lymphoma. So in this case, the person who might have been treated with radiotherapy, had we just done an MRI scan, with the PET CT scan, we've actually accurately staged that patient. And in this case, the best treatment for this person, because they're actually feeling quite well, is to observe them, to keep bringing them back to clinic. And we would only start treatment in the form of chemotherapy if they were starting to feel unwell. So a real change in what we did because of using the CT scan. Here's an example of using a CT scan to assess how chemotherapy has worked. In this person, they've got disease either side of the diaphragm and also in their bone marrow. And they had chemotherapy. After two cycles of chemotherapy, the lymphoma has melted away. A complete metabolic response. With this person with Hodgkin's lymphoma, we now know that for their remaining chemotherapy, we can stop one of their chemotherapy agents. We can stop the bleomycin, which can actually cause damage to the lung without 
And by even stopping this chemotherapy agent, we are not going to affect their outcome. And this is because we've done trials in people with lymphoma who've volunteered their time and energy to help us advance medicine and the field of lymphoma treatment. We can also treat patients who may not have had a good response to treatment like we can see on this side. This is what we call a partial metabolic response. But again, we have got several lines of treatment that we can give these patients and we can actually change the chemotherapy to something a bit more efficacious that could hopefully get this person a cure. And we know that sometimes people with lymphoma don't necessarily respond to that first line of treatment and they may require bone marrow transplants or even CAR T cell therapy. But again, we can still use PET-CT to help us inform how the treatment has worked. So this person was gonna go for a bone marrow transplant they had started some chemotherapy and we could tell the person and their doctors that following that chemotherapy, their lymphoma had gone away. So we're dealing with a really good situation for that person to have their bone marrow transplant. So it's hopefully some really good examples of how we can use PET-CT in particular in the management of lymphoma. So to summarize, hopefully I've shown you that scans really do play a central part in the management of lymphoma before, during, and after treatment. I've talked about the really important members of the imaging team, some of whom will be invisible to you, but hopefully you understand that they are crucial to the care of people with lymphoma. Hopefully you've now seen the various different types of scans that can be used to help people with lymphoma in various different situations, both before, during, and after their treatment. And then with my interest, hopefully I'll show you that PET-CT can be used in a whole host of indications in lymphoma and really has become the most important scan for people with certain types of lymphoma, um, particularly Hodgkin's lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. Thank you.